Hello there. I am here. It's hot outside. Ow, my hand. We're off to a great start. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Fight Fanatics Frame Data Primer stream. I'm starting a minute early because I can. Um, <clears throat> Alright, today we're gonna go over a lot of neat stuff about what a frame data is. Oh no, the spreadsheets. Yes, what is this? What are we looking at? I don't know what's going on. There's so much stuff on this page right now. There's so many numbers and like mishmash. What am I looking at? What is a frame data? Well, that's what we're gonna find out today. What? What is frame data? Fra la la la. What is frame data? Frame data. Whatever you want to call it. All right. So let's see. First up on our checklist today is how do you read frame data? What? What is it? What is this? Well. We need to understand, in fighting games here, is whenever you press a button, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up TFH here, you press a button, character doesn't attack. You know, you got your little, I'm pressing 5A here. Now, when you do that attack, there are several stages to the attack that happen. You have, like, the wind-up, you have won the attack and hurt the opponent, and you have, like, Arizona pulling her hoof back afterwards. So there's three stages to the attack. You have your startup, you have the active frames, and you have the recovery. Startup is how long it takes for the attack to actually come out. Well, before I can explain that, I guess, I should explain how time is measured in fighting games. So all of these numbers are actually measurements of time. They're how many frames there are, and a frame is 1 60th of a second. See, fighting games run at 60 frames per second at all times, pretty much. There's, like, very few fighting games that don't run at 60 frames per second. Them's Fighting Herds does uh, run at 60 frames a second. So when you see 5, that means it's 5 frames. You can easily demonstrate this. Uh, how do you demonstrate this? I can demonstrate the different, uh, you know... Parts of an attack just by going into training uh, options, going to attack data hitboxes, and turning those to advanced and on. So now we're in slow motion. Everything's a lot slower. You can actually see the individual frames. Now, when I attack, you look very closely in that little little top right corner up there. You have all these little squares. And these squares are the individual frames of your attack. So the startup frames, that's how long it takes before the attack actually comes out. So if I press the attack here and I go frame by frame, there's a few frames where she's not attacking yet, but she's starting to. Like, she can't hit the opponent, but she's starting to lift her, her hoof up to attack. That's the startup. That's, how, that's the wind up. She's winding up to, to hit them. And then after that, you have the active frames. Now this is when she's capable of actually hitting the opponent. That's like... You know, if you were trying to hit something, it's when your hand can actually hit them. You're not winding up, you're actually like, actively able to hit something. And we call those active frames. And that's an active hitbox right there. And then after that, you have a whole period of time once it goes away, where you can't do anything. And then eventually, you finally recover. A little bit of disjoint. And all that happens over the span of like a third of a second. At least in this case. And we can see that laid out here, at the startup active, and recovery. The startup is the wind-up, active is when you can actually hit the opponent, and recovery is when you're locked into your animation, you can't do anything, you just gotta wait for it to end. And those are the three basics of frame data. And as I said, it, 
the game runs at 60 frames per second, so if you see 5 startup, that means that it starts up in 5 frames, which means it's like 5 sixtieths of a second. And, you know, that's all well and good, it's cool to see the exact speed of all the moves, but what does this do for you? What does it all mean? What do, they, what do the numbers mean? What do they mean? Well, that's, uh... It's kind of important because it's good to know what moves you have that are fast. And the reason it's important to know that is because it's important to know how to punish things and stuff like that. Yes, the numbers, Mason. So, while it's important to know how fast your moves are and stuff like that, it's not as important to know how many active frames they have or how fast they are to recover. But what is important is this value here. It's the advantage on block. How do I zoom in? Um, how do you zoom in on this? Can you zoom in? There you go, there's frame data. Control and L. I just italicized it. <laughs> well. The plus key. I did do the plus key. Oh. Just the... What a... Ah! Everything's going wrong now. We're doing control Z. Okay. Let's zoom in. Sorry about that. For some reason it didn't work the first time I did it before. I did control plus and nothing happened earlier. It just came out with a pop-up. So, anyway. This is our most important thing to know here. This is, like, the two most important values in terms of frame data. I'm not saying that none of the values are important, like the other ones. They are important. But the two that you're going to be looking at the most when you're looking at frame data is startup and advantage on block. Now, what does advantage on block means? Well, when you hit your opponent, they get put in a little state called hit stun, where they can't move, they can't act, they can't do anything until the hit stun ends. And you're also locked into your animation, assuming you don't cancel your move, where you can't do anything until the, uh, your move ends. And the same concept applies to block stun. So if you hit them, and they block it, they're locked into blocking for a set amount of time, and you're locked into your attack for a set amount of time, and one of you is going to recover first. And advantage on block is a way of visualizing who recovers first and how much sooner they recover. So advantage on block is always measured from the perspective of the person doing the move. So Arizona is doing 5A, you know, standing A, f uh, jab, whatever you want to call it. And the number we see here is minus one. Now, what that means is that Arizona recovers negative one frames before Velvet. Which is a funny way of saying Arizona covers one frame after Velvet. Now, if we go into super slow motion here, I'm going to jab, and then I'm going to try to block as soon as possible. And... Velvet is going to turn- her hurt box is going to turn green when she's out of block stun, and my hurt box is going to turn blue once I enter block stun, which is the soonest I can act. Well, not block stun, but just blocking. So here we see that Velvet- one frame, this is the first frame of Velvet recovering, but I'm still in my animation, and in the very next frame, I'm able to block. So she recovered one frame before me. That's what negative one means. It means that your opponent will recover a frame before you if you use this move. And that's not that bad. What is bad is if you look at something like, I don't know, launcher. You got negative 17. Now that means that the opponent is going to recover 17 frames before you. And you can't do anything in that time, because Launcher can't cancel. Every character's Launcher is extremely, uh, how do you say, unsafe. Because you can't cancel it into anything on block. 
and they're all, if we go to through every character, Velvet is minus 16. Oleander, she's minus 17. Paprika, she's minus 16. They're all really, really negative values. And if you look at startup, you see that there are a lot of moves that are faster than 16 or 17 frames. So if you put two and two together, you'll see that if the opponent can't do anything, including block, they cannot block. If the opponent can't do anything after making you block this move, and you recover 17 frames before them, assuming that you're blocking it, that means that you can use any attack here that's faster than that to punish that. You know, this is like, this is the basics of frame data. You have your moves that are fast, and then you have the moves that have really negative values on block. And you can understand that if a move is negative 17, then that means that you can use your move that is five frames to, to punish them. That's just the basics of punishing right there. I believe we went over that a little bit in the last stream where we talked about how to lab punishes and training mode and stuff like that. But that's just the, the sheer basics of frame daddy. You have your startup, that's how long it takes for your move to uh, become active. There's technically four startup frames, but in frame data, they'll add the first active frame to the startup value to give you a better visualization of how fast the move actually is, because four frames doesn't mean that you'll hit them in four frames, and it doesn't mean that you can punish um, moves that are minus four if we put the, uh, the actual startup. So, let's see. What do you- so it's obvious that you can use this data here. You got negative 17. Let's say I go in here. Let's look at one of Velvet's moves here. Her jab is 5 frames. Let's record her doing a jab after blocking. And I'm gonna try my hardest to block after doing this move. I just can't block it. Wrong move. No matter what I do... I can't do anything, I can't block, I can't super, I am unsafe. And that's an important thing to know. That's one of the most important things you can get out of frame data, is understanding which moves are unsafe. Like, if you look at most of the moves in this game, they're all negative on block. There's very few moves in this game that are actually plus on block, and we're gonna go into that. But... If you can look at a move, and you see that your fastest move is 5 frames, and then you see that there's a move that is worse than minus 5, like that's minus 6, that's minus 12, that's minus 17, you can look at those moves and be like, hey, my move is fast enough to hit them before they recover. I'll recover 17 frames before them, I have all the time in the world to press my 5 frame move and hit them before they're allowed to block again. You know, that's... It's probably the most basic thing about frame data. I don't know how many people listening at home already know about that. It's like one of the first things you learn in terms of frame data. And this game does tell you that. This game is very special in its uh, design. It'll tell you the startup frames. It'll say four because it doesn't include the first active frame like the frame data sheets do. So, jabs are five frames, but it says four. Even if you look here in the top corner, you'll see that it's active on frame five. First active frame is on one, two, three, four, five, you know. But like, you'll see that if I make them block that, On minus 17. The game gives you the frame data for uh, on block, and that's helpful. But it's also helpful to be able to see every character's um, advantages and speeds on their moves in one little place, and that's where frame data sheets are very nice. So, we understand that the fastest moves in the game are five frames. Everyone has a five frame move, Everyone's 5A is universally 5 frame startup, which means that any move in the game that is minus 5 or worse is punishable. 
And you can actually measure this in sort of like degrees of punishableness. Like you see that Arizona's 5B is 8 frames. So if you look at any move that is minus 8 or worse, or let's say most mediums in this game are 8 to 10 frames about. You know, you see 9, you see 8. You see 10 here. Moves that are about minus 10, minus 12 or so, those are like medium punishable. Like, let's say you block, like, uh, well, for instance, Launcher. You can punish it with something better than 5A. What's so, uh? What's up? Did something break? I'm scared. I don't want to continue if something broke. But like... If you see a move that's only minus 5, minus 6, it's obvious that you can only punish with jab. But if you see something that's like negative 17, then you can obviously use a much better attack to start your combo, because 5As only do a little bit of damage, and the combos that you get from them are kind of weak. But if you start with a better normal, like a medium or a heavy, if you block a launcher, then you'll be better off. Of course, the dog next door is going to be barking his head off. Good timing. So you can kind of, like, look at moves and see how punishable they are. For instance, if we look at Arizona's C headbutt, it's minus 14. Now, most heavies in this game are like 12 to 14 frames, so it's going to be kind of hard to time a heavy to punish a C headbutt, but it won't be too hard to time a medium normal, like a 5B. So you can experiment with moves and see how that works. But of course, numbers don't always mean everything. Like, you can look at the frame data. Let's say you look at Velvet. You see that her Shatter C is minus 20. That's a lot. It's really unsafe. But, let's say you get a... Uh... No, I'll just have her do it after blocking something. Let's say Velvet uses it from here. So it's minus 20, right? Obviously my jab should be able to punish it. But... If I block it from here, even though I have the fast enough attack to hit it, I'm so far away that it doesn't matter. So, even though it's minus 20, it's minus a ton. You're not always going to be able to punish something just because you have the fastest normal in the game. You have to sometimes figure out more elaborate ways to punish things. Because I can't jab, even at point blank, I can't punish with jab. But I can punish with stomp. Wake up super on Arizona. Arizona's, yeah, see? Arizona's super is really fast. Yeah, if you look at it, it's actually three frame startup. And that's very fast for a move in this game. And it moves quickly, so you can do the math and in your head, you can be like, hey, this move starts up really fast and it goes far really fast. It can probably reach, and it does, you know. We block the overhead and we can punish it from far away. But like, just because a move is unsafe doesn't mean you'll always be able to punish it, because moves can be spaced, and sometimes your fastest normal won't reach. And you gotta be more creative with your solutions. So, what have we done so far? We looked at startup. Startup's important, advantage on block is important. Another important thing to realize about the startup of moves is that 
in some situations, you'll want to, like, challenge or, like, try to hit your opponent as fast as possible, and that's important to pick your normals wisely, because, like, what was I thinking? Like, if you're both just point-blank and you're doing nothing, one of you wants to attack. If you both attack at the same time, and one of you does an A, and one of you does a C, it's gonna... The A is obviously gonna win. You wanna choose the normal that makes the most sense in the situation. Like, you don't wanna jab from this far, it's not gonna do anything. And it's obviously gonna be outranged by something with much better range, like, you know, a sweep. A 2C. But if you're point blank, and then it doesn't really matter about the range, because the fastest normal will hit anyway. So it's a good time to break out the jabs. A lot of people will challenge with jab in like most situations, but you're not always in range for a jab. You're not always in range for your A. And it's also important to look at startup, in some cases, for overheads. So, like... You can actually see that the overheads in the game are slower than most moves. You have 6B, elbow drop, that's 24 frames. You have Shatter C is 30 frames. You have Oleander's Doomclaw, which is 23 frames. This, These are slower than just about any move in the game. Volcanic Ash... It hits grounded opponents on frame 24, you know. They're all in the realm of interruptibility. You can hit them out of it. Even if they do it in block strings, you can often hit them out of it. Like, if I were to have... Velvet do reversal jabs... And I try to do a 6B cancel... I'm often going to just trade or get interrupted because the move is a lot slower. So, frame data in this game, DJ Lab brings up exactly what I was about to talk about. I was about to talk about what goes on in this game in terms of canceling and what the minus frames mean. So, in most fighting games, and by most fighting games, I mean more traditional fighting games like Street Fighter, like, here we're going to take a look at some Street Fighter frame data. You see that a lot of normals on block have uh, positive values. There are very few that are minus. And then you have, like, some really unsafe moves. But most moves are positive on block, and they're also a lot more positive on hit. Like, you, he, you see here, this is stand medium punch. On hit, it's plus 7. Now, if we look at TFH's frame data, you'd be hard-pressed to find any normal that's more than, like, plus 2 on hit. Like, almost nothing is more than 0, 1, or 2 on hit. It's very rare. Now, if you look at, like, Street Fighter, it's important because you can't cancel normals into normals in that kind of game, so the frame data is going to be a bit different because you have to actually link all the moves into each other. You have to hit them before they get out of hit stun. And links are not really as prevalent in this game. The only time you're really going to get a link in this game is if you get a counter hit. Because counter hits in this game actually add 6 extra frames of hit stun. Uh, it's a little bit of a niche topic, but it is important to understand in this game that like, if you get a counter hit, see my 5B is plus 1 on hit. If I get a counter hit, it'll become plus 7. And my fastest normal is 5 frames, which means that I can hit them again before they get out of hit stun. And that's that's what we call a link. So you see there, that was a 2 hit combo, even though I didn't cancel a normal into a normal. I let my 5B completely end, and then I did that. But most moves in this game are minus on block and not very plus on hit. Almost every move in the game. There's there's like three moves in the game, maybe, that are actually plus on block. And they're very, like, niche in of themselves. Like, you have Arizona Counter, which is only plus one on block. So, how do you play around with that? 
Like, in Street Fighter, it's more cut and dry, because if you see a move as minus 2 on block, and almost everyone has a 3 or 4 frame move, that means if you're minus 2, there's absolutely nothing you can do to challenge the opponent in that situation. Because if they press their 3 or 4 frame normal, your fastest move will always get beat every time, because, you know, they're effectively using a 1 frame move because you're minus 2. There's nothing you can do there. This entire game, like Street Fighter, is entirely based around the fact that some moves are plus a certain amount, some moves are minus a very specific amount, and throws are 5 frames, and faster normals are less than 5 frames, and it's all based around this idea of like frame trapping with throws and stuff like that. It's it's very different from what you're used to in those fighting nerds, because it's a totally different mix-up situation. Now the mix-up the, the classic mix-up situation in a game like Them's Fighting Herds, which is like a, a chain fighter, I guess you would say, anime game, chain fighter, you have moves that chain into each other, and you have a lot of leeway on your cancels. So... I always do combo training. So, it's all well and good to see that this move, let's say 5B is minus 2 on block. It would make sense that if a move is minus 2 on block, if I tried to jab after it, the opponent would be able to jab first because they recover five, uh, 2 frames earlier than me. So their 5 frame normal will effectively be 3 frames against me. But that's just not the case. See, if I make... Let, let's go into this example here. This is probably the best example. Velvet has a 2A, it's minus 3 on block. It's not very good. It's not punishable, but it's also negative enough to be notable. Now, which one did I save this to? No. I think it's number two. So, that right there is Velvet doing a string into 2A and stopping her string entirely, and then doing a 5A, which is her fastest attack possible. Now, I can challenge this with my 5 frame normal because she's so negative. And that makes sense if you're playing from the standpoint of a game that doesn't have chain cancelling. Because in those games, every single normal ends the string technically and there's always a gap. There's almost never a true block string, there's always a chance for you to interrupt, and the p points where you can interrupt are always moves that are negative on block. But in this game, every move is negative on block. To some degree, for the most part. There's like three moves that aren't. So the frame trap mix-up reaches this weird point where... Technically, every move can be challenged after, if you block it. So like, I can challenge after that and interrupt her. But, you also have the fact that you can cancel further into your chain and interrupt any attempted interrupts. So like there... I believe this is like a perfect 5 frame gap, so I'm just... I, I timed it a little bit weird when I recorded it. But like... See, it would make sense for me to try to challenge in that negative 3 situation, but there's also the problem that she can just cancel further into her string and counter hit me. So, looking at this frame data, it's like, alright, so why does advantage on block matter at all if the opponent can just keep cancelling down the line? And the important thing to look at is that as you look further down the line, you see 5As and minus 1. That's not bad at all, actually, in this game, because this game doesn't have an input buffer out of block stun for normals. So in order to interrupt your 5A, they would have to be frame perfect with their 5A. So minus 1 is actually pretty good. Minus 1, you're sitting pretty in this kind of game. Minus 3, not so much. They have more than enough time. Like, a couple frames of difference is actually a lot. They have time to press a button. They have time to interrupt you, as we saw earlier. I was interrupting her 5A every time with my 5A. Now, if she stopped with 5A, I would have a harder time because I would have to be frame perfect. Otherwise, I would trade or get hit. 6A, every 6A is unsafe, so I'm going to skip those. 5B and 2B, minus 2, minus 3, they're also not that bad on block. But then you get to the C normals, and then you see that they're like minus 15, minus 14, 
you have launcher minus 16. The further down the line you cancel in your string, the more unsafe you'll be when you eventually end your string. See, you can see that with Arizona too. Minus one, minus one, minus two, minus two. These are great values, by the way. Like, she has a really good frame data on her A's and B's. And then 5C is minus 4. Alright, your pressure would end there, technically, if you stop there. 2C is unsafe. What can she cancel into from 2C? Launcher, that's unsafe. Elbow drop, that's unsafe. Headbutt, that's unsafe. Stomp, that's unsafe. As you go farther down the line, all of your safe options disappear. You can't go further without taking a huge risk and trying to purposely, like, frame trap people and hope that they get hit. Because if they just keep blocking, like... <laughs> I can just, like, do my best. I can be like, oh, they're gonna press a button eventually. And then I do that, and I get punished. So, your options start to wear thin as you go down your cancelling hierarchy. As you go from A, A, B, C. The farther you go down the line, the less options you have, and the more unsafe your options become. So, that all wraps back around to these values here. See... You have the most options possible when you end at A. Because you can cancel... If you do one A, you can do delayed cancel into another A, which is a frame trap. And then from there, you can also do Bs. Or you can just end your pressure right there and only be minus one and close. And it's kind of hard to push block A normals because they don't have a lot of blocks done. And they're also your fastest normals. So they're good to go for up close. So you're... If you go all the way down the line in your strings every time, a lot of people do this, they go all the way down the line in their strings, they don't hit confirm, and they just cancel into more and more unsafe things, and then their options wear thin and they get punished. And what higher level players will do is they will specifically use normals like this. They'll end at They'll start with a fast normal that has good frame data on block. And they'll stop there. But they won't stop there every time. Because obviously if you stop at the same place every time, your opponent will know when to challenge. Sometimes they'll keep going, and sometimes they won't. And this is like... This is the basis of frame traps and what we call stagger pressure in anime games. Staggering your strings basically means going through them slower and sometimes resetting them. Because your opponent, if you always stagger with normals that are only like minus one, your opponent will never get the real opportunity to punish you. And punishing is one of the only ways to get guaranteed damage. If you never do an unsafe move, the opponent can never punish you. If you always do your safer strings with good frame data then you'll be safe all the time. And the only way that your opponent can hit you is if they take a big bet and try to hit you out of your negative situations. Which means that they have to get a, a read on when you're going to stop your string at all. Because if you keep canceling your string delayed, you're leaving so many gaps where they can get hit. And if they pick the wrong time to challenge, they're gonna get hit. But in order to keep up your stagger pressure, you also have to not do your chains sometimes. So it's like, on one hand, you can... You're going to be ending your strings, like, if you're gonna do this. You're gonna end your strings at some point, which means that your opponent is going to want to hit buttons at some point. But you also are going to do chains sometimes, and your opponent is gonna not want to hit a button because of those chains. It's like a weird mix. And it's important to look at the advantage on block for some normals, so that you can understand when it's safe to reset your pressure, and how bad it is, or how risky it is. Because resetting your pressure off of 5C, for instance, that's borderline punishable. Minus 5 is punishable in this game. Minus 4 is one frame away from being punishable. You're at such a bad spot in that situation. But you can still cancel, and your opponent might be hesitant to challenge. Yes, staggering helps a lot in trying to pressure your opponent. In fact, always finishing your block chains is probably the worst route to go to. Not worst to, I would say. Well, finishing your chains with something unsafe like launcher is definitely the worst route you can do. Um, but finishing your chains every time is basically like 
you completely disregard the entire mix-up of the game, the entire mix-up of frame traps and, uh, and how pressure actually works. Because pressuring in this game, like, maybe if you're playing Tienwo, you don't care about this mix-up at all because your, your buttons have terrible frame data, but they have really good frame data if you cancel them to flight. So her pressure is different. But like, if you're playing Oleander, you have 5A and 2A, and those are your only good normals that aren't- Those are your only normals, period, that aren't technically punishable. 5B is minus 5, 2B is minus 6, which means that your opponent doesn't even need to take a bet, like... You don't have to, uh, end your string and then press another normal to get punished. Like, normally, if I were to get punished here, like, let's take- let's go back here, for instance, where Velvet is doing a normal after resetting her pressure, but I choose to challenge at this exact moment. You don't even need to do that to punish Oleander. Like, you don't have to take the bet that they're gonna reset pressure and try to press another button, because they can just block, and then you'll take your turn, but you won't punish them. But with Oleander, if she chooses not to chain, She's actually punishable. She's not pseudo-punishable, it's not the end of her turn, per se, she's actually punishable. Unless she does 2A or 5A, which are really good normals in their own right, but it also limits her frame trapping options. So, like, if you see an Oleander always going for these strings, like, sometimes they're gonna end in Fireball, but if she ends in Fireball, she's minus 2 and she has no more chaining options at all, so she technically just loses her turn entirely by ending in Fireball. And if she doesn't end in Fireball, she's punishable. And if you instant block Fireball, that's something I have to talk about here. If you instant block a move, it becomes 3 frames worse on block. So, Fell Spark is minus 2 on block, does 32 frames of block stun, that's what the italic number is. It's minus 2 on block at point blank. If you instant block... Uh, a Shadow Spark. She's minus 5, and she's actually punishable by 5 A's. So, if you're playing a character like Oleander, you should be focused on resetting Stagger Pressure with this. Like, it's gonna be risky to go for Stagger Pressure with these normals, but sometimes it'll be necessary because if you if you just always stop after two 5As or two 2As, because you can't cancel them more than twice in a row, you always reset after the second one, then you're always going to get challenged. But if you sometimes cancel into this, like, it's, it's a weird sort of situation where you have to sometimes do the more unsafe thing to make them respect the more safe thing. That's like the fundamentals of pressure in a game like this. Like, sometimes you don't want to go for the more unsafe move, but sometimes you have to, just to force that respect. Now for... Uh, one good example of this, if you look at um, Velvet's Ice Eruption here, you'll see one of the few positive values in this entire game. You see plus two. Velvet has a plus unblock normal. Which means... If I block this and try to challenge, I'm going to get beat every time if she's, like, good about her timing. I can't use my fastest normal here. Like, maybe I can use a reversal, but that's risky because she might just block. I can't actually challenge this because it's plus unblock. But... Velvet also has the unfortunate f uh, factor of that eruption attack actually being interruptible. So... Let's say I... Eh, I'm having a hard time showing it off, because Arizona's 5A is kind of stubby. Yeah, stubby 5A. If you instant block it, it's very easy to interrupt, if I could actually get it. Wow, I am bad today. Please! Instant block. I don't know. Ugh, that's embarrassing, honestly. There it is. Alright. So, Velvet's Eruption is interruptible. So it's plus on block, but it's also interruptible. 
So if you can just interrupt it every time, if she does it in the same spot every time, then you can interrupt it every time. But sometimes, like let's say she does something more like, uh, so you saw that her string was 2C eruption. That's interruptible. But let's say that she does something different. Let's say, say she does 2C into... Oh, well, okay. Let's say she does 2C into Shatter. Now, no matter what I do, I'm not going to interrupt that. So, even though she might not want to do the unsafe option, she kind of has to sometimes to force you to respect the option that lets her extend her pressure. Because Eruption is plus two, you can't do anything to interrupt it afterwards if you block it. You can interrupt it before it comes out, but you can't interrupt it after. You can't interrupt her options afterwards. So, once again, there's that situation where you have to go for the unsafe continuing the chain so that you can establish some fear in the opponent where they don't want to press a button because they got counter hit before. That's like the basis of close range pressure in this game. Now, all of this is well and good. It's like, a, on its own, it would be a very strong uh, form of pressure in this game, honestly. But this game also has push block, this game has instant block. And instant block complicates things a whole lot, because instant block makes things minus uh, 3, like, worse. So any normal that's minus 2 will become punishable, technically, if it's instant blocked, because it'll become minus 5. But... You also have push block, which forces the opponent away. And forces them to end their string there and try to pressure, like, reset pressure anyway. You have instant block, which makes things worse on block and reduces the amount that people are pushed back. Because sometimes, like, your move is really unsafe, but it also pushes them a bit farther back. So, like, a well-spaced 6A is gonna be hard to punish. Because it's only minus 7. Ah, yeah, we saw that there. It says minus 5. Uh, one small side note that I should mention is... If you look at the frame data sheet, you'll see active frames. Most moves have a lot of active frames in this game. It's probably to make moves, uh... <clears throat> easier to use in combos, just to make combo strings more lenient. You'll see 5 active frames, you see 10 active frames on 5, see 8 active frames on 2C. You look at Paprika, she's got like the same thing going on. 10 frames, 8 frames. So it's like... You can do something called a meaty attack, where if you knock the opponent down, or if you hit if you hit with the later active frames of a move, whether it's after knocking someone over, or like just dashing up and doing a button, it's gonna be hard to demonstrate. Let me not. Well, 5C, you see, is minus 4 normally. You can see that in the bottom. Minus 4. If I knock Velvet over, and I hit her well into my active frames, it became plus 5. And that's because, no matter what point you hit the move with, the amount of blocks done it establishes will always be the same. But because you hit later into the animation, you recover several frames earlier. So, because this has 10 active frames, it became plus 5 instead of minus 4. Because minus 4, uh, plus 10. Or plus 9, actually. Minus 4, minus 4 plus 9 is positive 5. So, a lot of these normals can actually become plus on block if you use them like that, because they all have a lot of active frames. So you could actually take, let's say, Oleander's jab that's minus 2, and actually make it plus 2 if you time it correctly. Or if you hit it from far away, like while you're dashing forward and you hit with the later active frames, because, you know, you have 10 active frames, if you hit with the 10th active frame, or if you hit with the 5th active frame, it won't be as bad for you. That's just a little side note. What were we talking about? We were talking about stagger pressure, right? 
how frame traps work. What do you, what do you want to review? I can go for a little bit of review if you have any questions real quick. Because we talked about uh, what the values in frame data mean, like basically. Very basic. Startup is how fast the move is. Advantage on block is who recovers first and when. Ah, the video itself. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be uploaded to the FF channel. The beginning of the stream, I was talking about how to read these values at all. Because I figured that some people wouldn't understand what any of these meant to begin with. And now I was going over why these values are important in this game. Like, why minus one is important. How frame traps work. A lot of... I would say very few players have the whole, um, the whole frame trap mix up down to a science. Most people finish their strings without a second thought. I, I'm guilty of it myself. I rarely have to bring out stagger pressure against people because a lot of people, um, just don't respect full strings. They don't wait to punish. And a lot of people don't, um, go for stagger pressure themselves. So it's not something you see a lot of people dealing with in this game. But it is an important factor. And now, to make things even more complicated, let's go to the left here. Universal mechanics here. If you look here, you'll see backdash invulnerability. Backdashes have 8 frames of invuln starting at frame 2. If used as a reversal, which means that if you use it after you wake up or after you come out of block stun, it has frame 1 invuln with 9 frames total. Now, if you keep in mind how all this has worked so far. Let's go back to the playback here. So if you remember, recording 3 was Velvet doing the frame trap with the 2B, which I can't interrupt with my 5A. It's a true frame trap. But, I can backdash. If I'm good. I can backdash. That's invincible. That's a true reversal. I can get out of the string. I can get out of the whole frame trap scenario just by backdashing. And that adds a whole different layer to this because you can actually cancel your backdash. Can you pull that off with Paprika? Let's see. Her backdash is still technically a run. I mean, her backwards run is still technically a backdash, duh. Yes. And as you can see, if I time things well... Which I can't, apparently. See, the issue is here is that I've accidentally demonstrated what I was going to explain next, is that sometimes some moves, because moves have 5 active frames, the 9 frames of backdash invuln will cover them if they're done quickly. But if the opponent does a delayed normal, a normal that reaches far, and a normal that has a lot of active frames, for instance 2B, the normal that we're looking at here with Velvet, has 6 active frames, and it goes like a pretty decent uh, distance. So, a lot of times you can backdash out of pressure. Like, I can backdash out of her little, uh... Oh, I forgot I, I deleted that recording. The recording where she did uh, eruption into jab. Which is a true uh, pressure string, and you can't interrupt it. But you could technically backdash away from the 5A, and then whiff punish it. So you use your invincibility to get away, and then you use your own long-ranging normal to hit them out of their recovery. But, if the opponent intentionally looks at what you're doing, and goes for a later normal... I don't like that I keep getting instant block. Whatever. If they intentionally do a later normal that has a lot of active frames, they can catch you. So there's a third layer to this whole frame trap mix-up. 
Because you have the layer where the opponent wants to interrupt you so that you can't reset your pressure safely with your normals that are only like minus 3 to minus 1. Then you have the layer where you cancel into more unsafe things to interrupt them trying to interrupt you. And then you have the layer where you can backdash to get out of the whole mix-up, but they can also purposely do specific moves to catch your backdash and punish you, because backdashes you can't block after doing. So, there are several layers here, and backdashes work so well because they have 9 frames of invuln, and most moves in this game have 5 active frames. So, if you're going to try to catch backdashes, you gotta look at your moves and say, hey, which ones reach far and have a lot of active frames. For example, Paprika herself, she has 2C. She has this thing. This thing is backdash catching heaven. If she's trying to pressure you and try to catch you with a command grab, or trying to frame trap you, or like reset her pressure with the lows, and the opponent just tries to backdash, like let's, let's do a block recovery here. Let's record it. Let's actually remember to record. Let's mash backdash. Reversal backdash. There you go. Let's have them block always. So I'm Paprika. I'm trying to command grab them. I'm trying to, uh, you know, do stagger pressure. They keep backdashing out. I can't catch them. Or 2A is good at catching backdashes. As you can see there. Or you can go for the hard callout and do that. Like, that didn't seem like much of a delay, but it was enough of a delay where I probably would have been able to get interrupted by a 5A. But I also very easily caught the best backdash in the game, because uh, Velvet does have the best backdash in the game. It goes fast, it goes far, and it recovers quickly. But you can call out that sort of thing. So there's a third layer to this whole mix-up. And it's important to understand that this mix-up works because of the frame data, you know. You see which moves are likely to have people try to challenge after, like, when you understand that you can do the more unsafe moves to force that respect. But it's important to know your frame data because normally you don't want to go farther than the least unsafe move in your arsenal. You don't want to go farther than minus four. Minus four is the magic number where you're not punishable by normals. You cannot be jabbed. You're safe, technically. And you're also in a position where you can take a bet and go for a more unsafe normal just to catch them trying to challenge you. That's assuming they don't push block you. If they push block you, the entire mix-up is gone. If they backdash, the mix-up is gone, but it's like different. Because backdash is riskier in the sense that it can be punished. Push block can't be punished because it's blocking. But um, backdash can be punished, but it also gives them an opportunity to whiff punish your pressure. So it's like, it's two-way street. There's a lot of options that both players have in the whole scenario. And it's all because of the way that these numbers work. Minus one is really safe to reset pressure with. Minus four is almost unsafe, it's like borderline unsafe, and then at that point you have to do more risky stuff. Arizona has really good frame data for this sort of mix-up. She excels up close. If you know anything about her, she's really good up close, and that's because she can reset pressure off of five different normals, all of which move her slightly closer and lead to pretty good damage if she gets a hit. So she can reset pressure at any one of these and then also frame trap from them while Oleander can only safely reset off of two normals, Paprika can safely reset off of four normals, Palm, poor Palm can only, like, she, she has a hard time with this, but she also has dogs, so it's, I don't know. Every character varies in how good their pressure resets are. Like, Velvet gets, like, minus three usually. A lot of people end at 2A or 2B. But it's important to understand, like, what normals you can challenge against where. Because, like, even if Oleander tries to reset pressure from, say, a 5B, if you're, like, Velvet, and you press 2B, it's 10 frames. Oleander is minus 5 after that. If you press 2B and she presses 5A, you'll trade. If she resets off of 2B and you press 5B, 
You won't get a punish, but you will interrupt her if she decides to go for anything. You'll get more damage, so it's like, there's different degrees of challenging and punishing, too. Like, when it's good to do that. And then once again, instant block changes the whole thing, but that's... That's another story. Because minus one moves are the only moves that are technically safe against instant block. Because minus two becomes minus five. That complicates things. Like, this is... The intention of the stream was to explain how to read the frame data, but it's more about how to understand what the frame data means in this, like, how is this significant? And that's what I'm trying to get my point across here, that these numbers are very significant to the core mix-up of the game. What did I do? Okay. Because, like, it's, it's important to understand when things are punishable. It's important to understand what your fast normals are. And then it's important to understand what staggering is and how these normals are, like how they work. Like if you look at frame data for a game like Eunice, you have the same deal. You have some normals that are technically unsafe. You have some normals that are good for resetting pressure with. You have like minus three, minus two. This game is similar to TFH in the sense that it has its fastest normals are five frames. So minus two is the same deal. Minus 6 is punishable. You know, minus 7 is punishable. But you can also cancel further down the line. Or like Guilty Gear also has similar stuff. You got minus 3. Fast normals in this game are 5 frames. This one is 0 on blocks. So that's actually really good. You know, you got minus 3. You got minus 7. These are all anime games. These are all games with chaining. And like, if you were to look at a game like this... You would have to understand what the core mix-up of the game is to really figure out how this frame data is significant. Like, you can easily uh, transfer it. You can um, transfer some form of knowledge to other games, even if their uh, frame data is completely different. Like, you can just look at the startup frames of the moves. You see that this move is, is three frame startup. That's fast. Let's see, let's go to a different character. Oh, look at that, it's Cammy. You look over here, she's got a three frame normal. So now you understand that three frames seems to be the fastest normal in the game. And that means that anything that's minus three or worse is punishable. So here you are, you've got minus three, it's punishable. You got minus 12, you know. You can easily look at the numbers, you can see which moves are the fastest, and then you can look at the frame data on block for different moves, and you can understand that those moves are unsafe. You understand that moves that are minus on block are, like, you can challenge after them. It's just harder to challenge in this game because of the fact that, uh, you can just cancel your chains whenever you want and leave gaps. Let's see. I'm looking at my checklist here. So here are all the things that I was aiming to go over today. We talked about startup, active, recovery, total frames we didn't really talk about, but that's just how many frames these add up to. If you look at the frame data here, um, it might not add up exactly. Like, C5 plus 5 plus 14 is not 23, it's 24. But that's because the fifth frame of startup and the first frame of active are the same frame. So you just add them all together and then subtract one. So that's how you get this value. And this is how many frames it takes to whiff the normal. Like, if you miss it, that's how many frames you're uh, vulnerable. So, like, for example, you whiff a 2C, you're active for 44 frames. You take that into consideration, that's three-fourths of a second. That's a lot of time in a fighting game. You whiff your elbow drop, you're at your... <laughs> you're out of luck for almost a whole second, you know? You whiff Magic Stomp, 70 frames where you're vulnerable. So that's what the total frames are. Startup frames is how long it takes for your move to become active. It's basically just the speed. You got 60 frames a second. So these are all faster than like the human eye can really react to. Overheads are actually fat, uh, slow enough to be interrupted usually. 
like if they're done as a delayed move, and they're also slow enough to react to, which is why you usually block low and then react to overheads and jumps. Um, oh, one important thing to note, none of the jump normals have advantage on block listed, and it's because it's very hard to measure them because it's very much based on height. But if you look in training mode and you do a jump normal, you'll see that I was plus 11 there, plus 17 there. Jump normals are special because they're a lot more committal because, you know, jumping reduces all of your, like, uh, defensive options. You can't cross canter. You can't, like, move around. You're stuck in your jumping arc. And if you do a jump normal, you run the risk of getting anti-aired. But if you make them block a jump normal, it's your turn. There's no challenging that they can do. You're like plus a million. You can do a true block string if you wanted to. So jump normals are unique in that regard. Where they're almost always extremely plus if they get blocked. And they often lead to good combos if they get a hit. But they're also able to be anti-aired, so it's not always, you know, not always as cut and dry as that. But that's why you won't see any values for jump normals, usually. Like, even... I don't even think there's any values for them. Yeah. Like, in this game, it says varies. It just says varies. It doesn't tell you what it is. It's just universally understood that uh, jump normals are usually good on block. What else is on this? Advantage on hit and block. Advantage on hit is a lot less important in TFH than it would be in, like, Street Fighter. I went over the fact that in Street Fighter and other games like that, advantage on hit is important because it lets you know which moves can link into which, but because you can just cancel your moves into each other in this game, it doesn't matter as much. The only time it does matter is if you get a counter hit because it adds 6 to this value. So if you get a counter hit 5A, you're plus 6, which means you can link another 5A. You don't have to cancel it. Or if you get a counter hit 2B, you're plus 7, which means you can link a 5A. That means that you don't have to technically um, continue your string if you try to frame trap with a normal like this. Because if you successfully frame trap, you'll get a counter hit. And you'll be able to confirm off that counter hit if you practice it. So you don't even have to continue your string into 5C and 2C without confirming if you're trying to frame trap. You can just end your string here, and then if you're blocked... You can try to reset pressure, you can block and see if they take their turn, or you can react to the fact that it got a counter hit, and then link a normal. So that's the only reason that advantage on hit is super important in this game. It's also important if you feel like just doing a normal reset on a grounded opponent, which is kind of weird to do I guess. Resets in this game aren't as crazy, but you can technically hit someone with a 5A and then throw them as a as like a, a, a reset. But not much reason to do that. Unless your name is Pap and you have this move. Hold on. Wow, backdash through that. There we go. Why can't I do anything today? Come on. Like, you can reset after this, you know. You can do a stagger and then reset after that, but, you know. Advantage on hit isn't super important in this game. It's more advantage on block that you want to look at. What are the faster normals in the game? And degrees of punishment. That's what we talked about earlier, where you see that your fastest normal is 5 frames. You see that some normals are minus 5 or worse. And you're like, hey, those are actually punishable. You see launchers minus 17, you see special moves and overheads. The important thing is to look at moves that can't be cancelled on block. So, for example, Oleander's Doomclaw, she can't cancel it on block. She's always minus 11. Like, if she does 5C, she's not always minus 6. Like, she is if she doesn't do anything afterwards, but she can also cancel it into other stuff and frame trap you. Which is part of that whole mix-up I was talking about earlier. But, like, if she does launcher... She can't cancel into anything else. You are guaranteed to hit her if you're in range for a normal to hit. So that's what we're talking about with that. So if you look at the fastest normal in a game, like for example, you look at in this game, you got your five frame normal here, and then you look at this normal, it's minus seven. That's technically punishable by five frames. You know, you, you can look at the numbers and see. You can comprehend that the fast normals will be able to hit moves that 
are more negative than the speed of the normal. Understanding that numbers don't mean everything. Yes, we were looking at... Velvet's... What do you call it? Or Shatter Sea. So just because your 5 frame normal will hit her minus 20 special move, doesn't mean you're always going to be able to punish with your 5 frame normal, because you're going to be too far sometimes. It's just not going to work out for you all the time. So, even though the frames might add up, sometimes you'll be too far to punish, stuff like that. And that's important to keep in mind. It's important to find moves that will punish. Like that. See, if we were to look at the frame data there, you would see that Paprika's C cartwheel is 18 frames. And Velvet's, uh, uh, uh what is Shatter C is minus 20. So, you know, 18 is faster than 20. There you go. What's next on the list that I want to review? Reactableness in terms of overheads. Like I was saying, most overheads are relatively slow compared to other normals, which makes them reactable, technically. Uh, Paprika's Cartwheel C is 18 frames. It's the fastest overhead in the whole game. That's actually pretty fast for an overhead in general. Most overheads in this game are 24 frames or worse. Like, uh, Shadow C is 30. Elbow Drop is 24. Oleander's Doom Claw is 23. Paprika is 18 frames. That's an exception. Palm doesn't have a grounded overhead, but uh, the Pilot Pup overhead attack is 28 frames. And then Volcanic Ash is 24 frames on grounded opponents. And the way you get that is you look at this is like 12 frames for the startup of the first hit. Then it has four active frames, so you're at 16. Well, technically 15, because this has... So you're at 15, yeah. This has the first active frame. So you add this, plus the active frames, so you're at 15. Then you have the, the gap, which is 8. So 15 plus 8 is 23, and then it hits on the frame after that, so 24 frames. The most overheads in this game are kind of slow, compared to every other normal in the game. You got five frame normals, which are 1 20th of a second. I believe. I'm correct. No, it's not 1 20th. What am I saying? It's like 1 12th. But it's fast. Almost every normal in the game is unreactable, technically. But overheads are reactable. And that also means they can be interrupted if they try to do them late. So that's an important factor. Because sometimes you can interrupt an overhead if you anticipate it. Um... Talked about punishes, talked about links, meaty attacks, I did a little side note on that. Stagger pressure, we had the whole thing about. Another important thing about stagger pressure is um, some characters have good options they want to go for that they can't cancel into. A good example of that is Paprika's short hops. She can't cancel into a short hop on block. See, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I can't do it. So if she wants to go for a short hop overhead, because short hops, they're kind of fast for overheads. Like, not super fast, they're slower than the grounded overheads, but they're fast enough to keep the opponent on their toes. And they're also very plus on block, unlike most overheads. Most overheads in this game, if you look at their frame data, you'll see, like, that one's minus 6. Um, Paprika's Cartwheel C is minus 15. Oleander's Doomclaw's minus 11. They're all unsafe. But if you short hop plus 11, which means that your pressure continues. But you can't cancel into that, you have to end your pressure to actually go for it. So that's another important factor, is that short hops and the like, like instant air dashes from Palm and Tienwo, for example, that's another example of things that people want to do. But they can't cancel into it. Um, if you anticipate that, that's just another reason for you to challenge with a jab or like a 6A. That's one of the situations where 6A is really useful, is that, um, let's say I'm Velvet and I'm defending against Paprika and she's coming at me with this, uh, I know that she's gonna reset her pressure into a short hop. I can just 6A at that moment. I mean, it's risky because I can get frame trapped, but at a high level, people are going to want to go for the option that's more rewarding and more powerful for them, even if it means taking the risk of getting 6A'd. 
But in order to do that, they also have to force the respect sometimes, and that's just... That's how the mix-up of the game works. A lot of people in this game haven't really explored this yet, and I'm looking to maybe get people to be more aware of this mix-up. Obviously, if no one's ever respecting your stagger pressure, you should just always frame trap them, and if they never press a button during your frame traps and never try to challenge after you stagger, then you should just keep staggering until you hit them. But at a higher level of play, this is actually, like, uh, really important. And it goes both ways, because you have to guess which one's gonna happen when. And you have to, like, get on the read on your opponent. Pretty neat. Uh, we talked about how instant block makes things a lot more unsafe. You can actually make some safe normals unsafe. Like, if you instant block Arizona's 5C, if you look at Arizona 5C, it's minus 4 normally. If you see an Arizona likes to end with 5C, then you can instant block the 5C, make it minus 7, and possibly punish it. So, instant block is good there. Backdash, as we saw earlier, um, if the opponent just doesn't want to deal with your mix-up, they can do two things. They can push block, which often ends their turn entirely, and gives you a chance to get back in anyway, because if you end your string the moment they push block, then you're free to move forward for like 20 frames. Um, and if they backdash, they have a chance of punishing you, but they're also more unsafe themselves. So, you have to keep those into account as well. Which just complicates the whole thing, but that's, you know, it adds depth. So we can, you know, mash backdash here. Velvet's just like, no, I don't want to get command grabbed. I don't want to get frame trapped. No. But I can purposely do my attack a little bit late to catch that. Because if she did backdash, and then she pressed, like, 5A, she could probably punish my thing if I miss. Like, if I do command grab, she could punish it. If I whiff 5B, she can punish it. So, backdash carries the possibility of punishing the opponent. But Paprika actually has a lot of really good moves for catching backdash. Like, her 2A inherently catches backdashes even during a stagger reset. Assuming they're point blank anyway. I don't know about this range. Yeah, no. But she has 2B. She has 2C. She has 5C, which can never be backdashed through because it has 10 active frames. That's an important thing to look at. Um, backdashes have 9 frames of invuln. But if you see a move that has more active frames than 9, for instance, Arizona 5C, Paprika 5C. What else? What else has that many active frames? Uh, I don't know. There are very few moves that have that many active frames. I know fireballs would work for that, so Oleander could cancel into a fireball and catch you. It's important to understand how those work together. And then we talked about how you can look at the fastest moves in a fighting game. You can see that, like, hey, that's five frames. So that means that anything that's minus, frame, minus five or worse is unsafe. And then if you look at this game, you see that has chains, then you can understand, hey, that whole stagger pressure thing works in this game, too. Meanwhile, this game doesn't have chains, therefore anything that's minus is automatically a lost turn, as they say. Uh, turns are basically what they mean when, like, you do a move that's minus, and then you wait because you know you might be uh, challenged, because your turn is over, technically. That's like the whole mix-up of the game, is that a lot of people- you'll, you'll try to steal your turn back by threatening the opponent with a frame trap. And then, if the second they stop trying to take their turn back is when you can use the stagger resets. The you reset your pressure. And get your options back. That's the important thing about all of this, is that... The C normals of this game are very limited in the sense that they are unsafe and the things that you can cancel into are usually unsafe or bad. They're hard to confirm from, they don't leave you in an, an advantage, uh, advantageous position, they're not good on block, and they're hard to confirm on hit. It's just, you don't want to go that far into your chain if you're pressuring. 
because you're limiting all your options. You want to try to keep as many options as possible available to you so you can, can threaten them more. But in order to do that, you have to take the risk of ending your string and possibly getting challenged, and then, then you have to go for the more risky options that limit your options to make sure that they don't challenge you when you try to get your options back, and it's just... It's complicated. <laughs> as a beginner, if you're a beginner and no one that you're playing against really takes any of this into account, no one tries to steal their turns, they just mash ball ends the second the block string ends, or they mash push block, the best that you can do with frame data is look at your normals, see which ones are fast, and understand which moves are punishable. You look at the normals that are the specials, you look at the attacks that have horrible frame data, and if you see that your opponent is doing that attack a lot on block, you can understand that you can get free damage on them because they're punishable. So if you see Arizona always going for C stomp in your face and she doesn't cancel it into anything, you're like, hey, that's minus 11. I'm gonna jab you. You see Velvet likes to go for her overhead. You see she's minus 20. You're like, hey, I can maybe try to do a ranged attack that hits her. See Oleander spamming her launcher on block because she doesn't know how to reserve herself quite yet. She's a beginner too. She doesn't know hit confirming. You can abuse that and punish her. And that's good for both players because it'll teach them that they can't always go for these options. That they should also be more reserved and thoughtful about their gameplay. So... But if no one ever punishes you for doing something bad, then you'll never learn to not do it. And, you know, you can help yourself improve by punishing things and getting that damage and getting that game awareness. And you can help the other player by teaching them what they can and can't do. So, it's a win-win, honestly. Even if the opponent probably hates you for always hitting them. Is that it? Is that all the stuff that's on the list? Pretty much is. Alright, I'm gonna close this. No, I'm not. I want to know if anyone has any questions. I don't know if I clarified on any of the topics well enough, so I'd like to hear what people have to say, if people understood what I was talking about, or if it's all too complicated for them to understand at this point. I'm totally open for questions. Just hit me with the big questions. Or at least, you know, tell me that you got it. Please, I need affirmation. I need reinforcement in my life. Will staggering work on a new player who is mashing out of block stun? No. And that's why a lot of people don't do staggering in this game. Because if someone's always mashing out of block stun, then if you try to stagger them, if you try to end your pressure early, you will get hit. But, that also means that if they're always mashing out a block stun, you can abuse that. Like, let's say, uh, most people press 2A, right? You see this a lot. Um, I'm Velvet, I'm just like, okay, I block something, I'm gonna press 2A, 2A. Right? So, what you can do as a player who's fighting against this, is while you can't reset your pressure, because your, your frame data is bad, your minus 2, you try to do something, you're gonna get hit. You try to reset your 2A. You lose your turn, you know, you get hit, you get punished, that feels bad. What you can do is, you can do the delayed frame trap strings that I was talking about. Because if they're always gonna mash out of strings, then you can always just purposely do a string that'll hit them. Even better, if you know exactly when they're gonna mash, you can purposely do a high damage starter. And you get that counter hit, counter hit 5c damage, for example. And of course, it's gonna be a little bit hard to, uh, learn the timing on these strings right away. It's something that you kinda have to, like, test out in training mode. You gotta see when you have to time things to catch jabs. 
Because jabs are technically pretty fast. They're five frames. It's not... They're not, like, instant, but they're also not slow. So you have to be able to fit a gap in your strings that will stop people from mashing. But if people don't respect it, then you never have to stagger. Yeah, delaying a chain and staggering is different. Staggering is when you reset your, reset your chaining. At least I'm pretty sure that's what it means. That's what I've heard it used for most of the time. Staggering is when you reset your chain entirely. Um, delaying a chain is frame trapping. It's, it's like the same thing. You can't frame trap with staggering in this game because every... It's not like other games where when you end your chain or end your attack, you're sometimes plus on block and they have to respect it. You're always minus if you end your chain, so you can't technically frame trap. You can't leave that little ga uh, gap where they can press a button. Yeah, if you delay the chain while you're still chaining. In this game, you can, um, you can cancel into normal at any point during, um, after you hit them or make them block, as long as you're still in the animation of your attack. Like, this is a cancel. That's a cancel. It's, it looks late. It looks late. It looks like I might have already ended my attack, but it's still a cancel. You have a lot of time. But, um, yeah. If you delay the chain, you have, you still have the advantage. It's, the way I would describe it is you're leaving a gap where they can press a button, but it won't hit before you hit them. You're leaving a tiny enough gap where they can try to do something, but if they try to do something, they will get counter hit because you're hitting them too fast. It's like a little gap. Yeah. They come out of block stun, but you're already attacking them. It's it's weird, it's it's hard to describe. They come out of block stun for just a few frames and they can press a button. But because you canceled into a normal, this frame down here doesn't matter if you're canceling at all. This is only if you end your chain. If you're canceling, you might as well be plus. But the problem is, is that if you cancel, you lose all the stuff behind what you canceled into. So you lose the options of 5A and 2A, which are really good on block, technically, and they're fast. So you lose that option, but you also have the opportunity to leave enough of a gap for them to try to do something, but they're not going to hit you. Yeah, block stun is playing around block stun and playing around people trying to. Yeah. You just do your strings late, or you reset pressure because they're doing your strings late and they're afraid of getting hit by your late strings. That's just the fundamentals of frame traps and stagger pressure in chain games like this. Yeah, the window to chain extends completely into your recovery. This isn't always the case in other fighting games, but in TFH, at any point during the recovery frames, you can continue your chain. Like, other games, sometimes, like, like... Let's look at this character here. Her 5A has a lot of time where you can chain into another normal. But like, if you try to chain out of something like her 5C, you have like no time. You can't delay it at all. But in this game, you can delay any normal at any point. During recovery. Like, you can see that with Pap's free t-shirt, with how late you can, uh, cancel that. Because this, the entire point of free t-shirt, actually sums up everything about what I've been explaining. Free t-shirt is stagger in of itself. It's a move that's unsafe, so the opponent is tempted to do something. 
but if you cancel it late, you hit them out of the something that they're trying to do. And if you force them to stop trying to press buttons every time to try to punish it because you're hitting them with the frame trap, because you're delaying it every time, then you can just, like, let's say I did that enough times and now Velvet's like, oh no, I can't press jab because I keep getting counter hit. Now I can get the low and reset my pressure. Even though this, this move is minus eight, it's unsafe. They can jab it, they can punish it. If I force them to respect it by delaying my cancels, I can go for the better option because they're scared. And obviously the effectiveness of your stagger pressure will differ based on what normals you use and what normals you try to reset pressure with. Resetting pressure with a minus one or minus two move is actually really good in this game because there's no input buffer on pressing normals at a block stun. So they have to press their 5A within a one or two frame window in order to actually interrupt yours. Which is why Paprika 2A works so well. It's minus two, but there's no, um... There's no buffer for normals. And there's no really fast specials in this game that have input buffer. Like, Arizona Super is three frames, but there's no input buffer on it, so if they mess- they mistime it, they'll just get cross canter. Or, uh, push block. So it's like... Velvet has to press A in, like, a, a two-frame window here in order to interrupt me from doing this over and over again. Granted, I also have to press my buttons at a decent time, too. So, if you're going to go for resetting your pressure, you're gonna want to look at your normals that are minus four or better. So minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. Paprika happens to have one of each of those. And if you're going to look into uh, delaying your normals to catch people who are mashing or trying to backdash, you're going to want to look at normals that have a lot of active frames and decent advantage on hit. Because if you have a normal that has good advantage on hit and you get a counter hit, you can link afterwards. So, PAP 5B is really good for this because it catches mashers and allows a link afterwards while not pushing the opponent too far away. And it will also catch backdashing if you time it right. Because it has what? Like, well, every move in this game has five active frames. So, if you do it too early, they'll backdash through it and punish you. And if you do it too late, they can mash out of it. So it's kind of weird how you have to time your normals to specifically call out mashing or backdashing. But that's just the way that it works out in this game. And then you have normals like 5C, which are unsafe, but they'll catch both because they have that many active frames. And the only way you can really understand why these work the way they do is if you know how the frame data works. If you understand that backdashes have 9 frames of invincibility, and that the fastest normals are 5 frames. But look, I actually have a second controller. I forgot about that. I probably could have been using that the whole time to help. Oh well. But yeah, frame data... This probably seemed like it was just gonna be about, hey, Here's how you read these numbers, here's what they mean, but I'm actually trying to give you guys a little bit of a, uh, a primer on why these numbers are important to know. Like, it's one thing to be able to read the frame data and know what it means, and it's another thing to know and understand how it affects gameplay and how you can use it. Of course, it won't work. If you don't practice it, if you don't know what normals are good to use, and if your opponent never actually respects your pressure resets, but then you can just, you know, 
reset your pressure, not reset your pressure, just do your delayed strings and catch them mashing every time, so. Just know that you do not want to do the moves on block that are super minus. It's safe to end your strings with moves that are minus four or better. And your fastest moves are five frames, and you can look at different unsafe moves in the game and pick which normals are best to punish those with, or when it's good to challenge. Like, you don't really want to challenge after Arizona 5A all the time. You probably just want to push block that if you can, because minus one is really hard to challenge in this game. But, you know, you see Oleander doing launcher, you punish it. You see that your 5C has 10 active frames, you know that you can uh, catch back dashes with it. It's just, you, you put the pieces together, but in order to put the pieces together, you gotta understand how they work. That's what I've been trying to do here. Are there any more questions? Any more thingamajigs? Been an hour and a half already somehow. My voice is getting tired. What does chaining do to your startup frames? Chaining does nothing to your startup frames, it just cuts off the recovery frames. So, let me go into this here. So normally you have 12 recovery frames after 5A. And it has 5 frames of startup. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, look, that's 5 frames. And normally you would have to sit here through recovery, but I just chained it to another 5A right now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It just kills the recovery frames, it doesn't do anything else. If you chain, it deletes recovery frames, basically. It interrupts your recovery frames and just starts the next move. That's all it does. That's why I was saying that advantage on block doesn't matter if you're just gonna cancel into your chains. It only matters if you're gonna reset your pressure. You're gonna reset your chain, stop your chain, cut your chain short, whatever you wanna call it. Or if you're gonna do an unsafe move that you can't cancel out of. That's the other time it's important. And that's what you want to avoid doing. You want to avoid doing, like, Paprika Super on block. I mean, yeah, you can use it as a gimmick frame trap to catch someone trying to punish your cart C, but you're also going to get horribly punished if they just respect it, which they probably should be doing. But yeah. Anything else? Tiny review. This is how fast your normal is. Game runs at 60 frames per second. Each of these is a frame. That's how fast your normal is. That's how many frames it can hit the opponent. That's how long it takes for it to finish after it's done being active. That's who recovers first. If you're a negative value after you make someone block an attack, then you recover after them. This game is full of negative values because of the way chaining works. If you're chaining, the opponent can't mash. But if you end your pressure, then they can try to mash and challenge you, and you lose your turn. And that's the basic mix-up of the game. If a move is minus 5 or worse in them's fighting herds, not for every game, but in them's fighting herds, if a move is minus 5 or worse, it is punishable. You want to look for moves that they can't cancel out of that are punishable, and if you see opponent doing it a lot, then you can punish them every time for free damage. Um, instant block shaves off 3 frames of block stun, so moves that are minus 2 become minus 5, moves that are minus 1 become minus 4, minus 5 becomes minus 8, so on and so forth. Counter hits add 6 frames of block stun, so 5b goes from plus 3 on hit to plus 9, which means that you can link out of it, because if the opponent is still in hit stun and you have a fast enough moral, you can hit them while they're still in hit stun, and that's called a link, and it will be a true combo. So if you frame trap with 5b, then you can confirm into jab as Paprika. If you frame trap with Velvet 2B, you can confirm into jab, and so on and so forth. What else? Ah yes, if you hit a normal late into its active frames, you'll actually get better advantage on block. So this move here with 5 active frames can go from minus 1 to plus 3 if you time it right. But that's only if, they're, if you hit them like with the later active frames. It's hard to time, you have to do it when they're getting up or like as you're moving forward, it's weird. What else? For this lightning round. Backdash has 9 frames of invincibility, so you have to watch out and try to delay your attacks to catch backdashes sometimes. 
Uh, it's kind of hard to deal with sometimes if you're not looking for it, because it is invincible and they can punish you if you whiff something. So it's important to be on the lookout for that. Most invincible moves in this game are really slow, so oftentimes you can whiff a jab and still block. That's important to know. And yeah. I think that's it. If you're Arizona and you delay chain 5A into 5B, it depends on when you time the chain, the chain. But if you leave a 4 frame gap, then she can never hit you. She'll always get interrupted. Like, you have to be able to time the gap so that it gives them time to press the button, but not enough time to hit you. But, technically speaking, if Velvet hits her normal ever and you time your chain properly she will always get hit because you can cancel your recovery at any time the block stun of your normal doesn't change at all it's just the recovery that changes recovery just disappears technically if you look at this 5a has 18 frames of recovery and you know advantage on block is minus one which means that technically the opponent recover uh Recovers from block stun on frame 17 of her recovery. But she can do another 5A 6 frames in, which means that there's 7 frames of block stun, or 17 frames of block stun afterwards. And this is 5 frames, so it'll be a true block string, you know, they there is no time. Which is why you have to delay so much, is because there is a lot of block stun on these moves. It's just you have to time it. You have all of your recovery frames to time it. It's just, if you time it too early, there'll be no gap at all, and you'll just have a true block string. And there's no mix-up with that at all. Unless you're, like, you're doing a low or an overhead. But there's no, there's no mashing mix-up, and getting counter hits is important in this game because of the way that it, uh, resets Juggle Decay. Oh yeah, speaking of which, we've been talking about frame data the whole time, but this sheet has damage values and Juggle Decay values, so it can actually be of use for other reasons. But yeah, if you time your chain too early, there won't be a gap and there's no mix-up involved. And if you time it too late, you might get jabbed out. There's a dog barking outside. Yeah, you can go into training mode, you can use the block stun hit stun bar to get a feel for it. You can also do what I've been doing during this stream and go into block recovery options. You set the opponent to always block down here. And then you go to block recovery options, record slot one, just like mash A really fast, and then set it to on. And then you can just practice your strings like that. Now obviously I didn't time this very well because she's still blocking for some reason. There we go. Yeah, I didn't time my reversal jab very well, but let's try that. Yeah. So this is the best way to practice this. Like, you see, if I do it too late... If I do it too late... If I do it too late... Oh my god, I can never do it too late. There you go. <laughs> if I do it too late, I get jabbed. And if I do it too early, then it's just a true block string, and I don't get any possible chance of hitting them. But yeah. Just to reiterate that, if you're gonna be doing that, then do that. It's pretty hard to delay, yeah, it, it's actually kind of hard to delay your chains that late. I had to do it on purpose. Of course, one thing to watch out for is the fact that if you delay your chains, your opponents can do reversal attacks that are invincible, which is just another part of the mix-up. But, you know, these games have a lot of layers to them. There's a lot that goes into uh, just simple pressure that a lot of people don't take into account. 
And I'm just trying to open everyone's eyes a little bit and show them what this game is actually, like, built on. Because you see a lot of people just finishing their chains, going straight into sea attacks, going into launch, or going into unsafe specials, and not really thinking about what would happen if they delayed their chains to catch people mashing. Or if they, um made people respect their chains, and then decided to end their chains and keep their pressure going, and stuff like that. So, now, maybe there's a little bit more understanding, and you might not get it immediately, you might not fight someone who ever respects your chains, and they'll always get counter hit, but hey, that's something you can abuse and win with. But if you fight against someone who's higher level and knows when to challenge, knows to wait until your string is over and punish you, you can start implementing these sorts of strategies against them. For instance, there are some players that I fight against that force me to do this, because they just never get hit otherwise. I have to go into pressure resets, I have to throw them after making them block a 2A. Because they are just so good at blocking the overheads that I have to go for frame traps and staggers. There's nothing else to it. It's it's the it's the fundamental mix-up of the game. Once you reach the level where people start to punish everything that you do, that's unsafe. Because once everyone punishes everything that's unsafe, then you can't just go for those gimmicky uh, special moves that hit people that aren't uh, blocking. And then you gotta start thinking about it, and that's where all this information comes in handy. Because then you can know the good places to reset your pressure. I think I've reiterated the same thing too many times now, and I should probably stop talking, but I'm bad at uh, ending streams. So, if you have any more questions, I will accept them. If not, I will end the stream in like 30 seconds or so. And I will thank you all for watching and listening to me babble on and on about how people aren't frame trapping in this game and how the frame data means that they probably should be. What about neutral rope? Uh, I'll tell you why it's not super good. It used to be worse. See those total frames? 20 frames startup, 1 active frame, 45 frames on whiff. Oh jeez, I wonder why. I wonder why. It used to be 55 frames on whiff. They made it slightly better, so I don't really talk about neutral rope anymore. Yep, one active frame. That's not gonna catch any backdashes. Unless you really delay it. But yeah. Thanks to those who actually attended and participated and asked me questions. I like when people talk. I hope I was helpful. I hope people can look back on this in the future and be like, hey, I learned a lot. And even if you didn't learn a lot, then, uh, maybe you will one day. Ah oh, yeah, this, this, this kind of stuff applies to a lot of chain fighters. It won't apply to things like, uh, Street Fighter. Because Street Fighter has a totally different uh, canceling system, as in you can't cancel normals into normals. But for this game, you, you can still utilize frame data knowledge in this game. You can understand when something's plus on block that it means you can pressure. This game just has no plus on block because it has chains. Chains are basically your way of extending your pressure, even if it is riskier. But yeah. Again, thanks for watching, thanks for attending, thanks for asking questions, hope you learned a lot. Uh, I don't know when I'm gonna have another one of these, I'm going to be gone for most of- for all of July and like half of August, so. Uh, you probably won't hear from me again for a bit. I might help with the next Young Lions stream whenever that is. I don't know what it's gonna be about though, so I'll have to wait and see. I think it's gonna be next week or the week after, I don't remember. But yeah, thanks for watching everybody. Everyone have a good afternoon. Oh no, I forgot to record all this. I'll just have to...
download the, the Twitch VOD. Oh well. Goodbye, everyone.